There's actually a really interesting article I read only today uh, on a site called Unheard, which I'd never heard of, ironically enough. <laughs> 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 Welcome everybody to Bad Voltage. Um, uh, we have the usual crew here: Jeremy, uh, Stuart, and myself. Hooray! And we're gonna de- yes, and we're going to dedicate the whole show to something that isn't news. <laughs> Ooh. Because we've actually thought about this episode in advance. Um, not very much, but but a little bit. So today, <laughs> <laughs> you may not have thought. <laughs> <laughs> I was mainly thinking of Jeremy. Um, to thanks, be fair. thanks, pal. Uh, so uh, in the last episode, we were having a conversation about episode, various things. Episode and before the, last, but yes. Sorry. Yep, yeah, you're right. See, this is the thing with no no preparation. Okay. Um, and uh, we asked the question, you know, what is basically the reason behind the uh, the ills of a social media? Like we often bag on social media um, in various ways. So what are the what are the root causes of this? And then also what could be a potential solution about this? So, you know, the, the social media is a challenging topic today and the world has obviously been waiting for three idiots on a podcast to discuss this. <laughs> so we're going to get into that for the full show. Um, and it's quite an interesting discussion, um, but we really want to hear about what you think about this as well. Um, so be sure to, you know, to jot your ideas down in your head and then go and share them on community.badvoltage.org afterwards. Um, I think that's about it, isn't it? Oh, and also Bad Voltage Live happening 9th of, um, uh, no, 8th of of March uh, in uh, Pasadena at scale. So go and check it out, badvoltage.org slash live. And now, Bad Voltage. A couple of shows ago, we were talking about our predictions, and specifically one about Facebook. And Jono asked the following question. Because this is a question, a broader question about, about social media. Because <clears throat> social media gets a lot of flack, right? For And I think we all three of us would agree that social media has had a pretty detrimental impact in society in many ways, right? And I think a lot of our current political fighting and discourse that we have is because of social media, because a lot of people have this yeah. megaphone that they didn't have. Um, but is that the fault of the social media networks or is that simply because we, the technology has been developed, which gives everybody a voice, you know, is it, is that the fault so of humanity I, I, for being shit, shitheads? I, or yeah. is it the, I think that it, oh, the, I don't know the answer to that question. I, so I don't know the answer and I think it's a really interesting question. And I honestly think it's something we could do an entire show on and it would be yeah, fascinating. We, could, we should but do I think, that. Well, this is that segment, gentlemen. And for <laughs> once, we actually followed through and are now doing so. I know. I know. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's incredible. Like, Stuart is used to following through in many different ways, but this Thanks. is not one of them. Excuse um, me. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so the, I mean, what do you think? What, 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 what is to blame for these ills <clears throat> of social media? Yeah, I mean, well, f- first start, we'll just... Or do we just take as read the ills of social media are lots of divisiveness in society, people being ill-tempered with one another, um, people getting uh, constantly verbally beaten down, oppressed, whatever. I, 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 we, we probably don't need to go into those in detail. We sort of take as read there are a bunch of problems like that associated with social media. Yes? I think, we'd, I th- I think we would definitely agree... I think we'd all agree on those ones. I think there may be additional issues. I was going to say, I I think it's bigger than that because at its core, you can see there's press releases about how Facebook specifically, the one I'm thinking of, but I'm sure other social networks are similar. Like they're designed at a very core level to in some ways make you feel bad because it keeps you engaged. Right. And because they're, what they're doing is not just trying to amplify, but augment. And in that, in their desire to monetize you as a person, they're trying to engage you regardless of whether that engagement is, is negative or positive for humanity or for you personally. So it right. it really results in them amplifying the most narcissistic behavior, the loudest people, the most toxic people. And and then 
getting the most lonely people, I think, to be the most engaged on the other side, looking for that dopamine hit when someone likes something that you did. So I think because manipulation is core to what they do, it's not just an amplification, but it, it is that manipulation that's the problem to me. Uh, and I think um, phrasing the question in that way indeed answers the question of why social media is responsible for this kind of thing, exactly for all the reasons you just outlined, Jeremy. It's right. it's, yeah. de- it's designed to explicitly amplify and accentuate things which engage people's interest and unfortunately no one's engaged by things they feel neutral about and people are more engaged by things they dislike and want to push back on than things they like i mean it's ironic that almost nobody who runs any kind of a social network has a notion of downvoting as well as upvoting everyone everyone who's got downvotey stuff does so because they have had for years and years and years slash dot had it and reddit's got it but everyone else has got likes but don't have dislikes but ironically the the, the the thing that motivates everybody is is disliking stuff because that's what you push back on liking you can just tick the little thumbs up button and then go on your way it doesn't drive engagement Facebook has kind of tried to bridge that a little bit with the um, the little emoticon or the emoji faces. Um, so you know, so if somebody posts something and it's sad, then there's the, the, the there's the crying face or there's the angry face. So it, I think it, that bridges the gap a little bit. I actually think it's kind of a smart design because a, a downvote is a very explicit statement of like this is horseshit. Right. And some people will, will, will say that either because it doesn't add to the discussion or because they disagree with that person, which is the problem that Reddit's had for years. The Facebook thing is a little bit more of a here's my reaction to what you're saying, but I'm not trying to get rid of it, which I think is an interesting spin on the concept. It is. A down vote without context is useless to me because it, are you disagreeing with the person? Do you think what they said is incorrect or just wrong, stupid? Is it just you don't personally agree, even though you think they are correct in what they're saying? It's, right. They're, they're, a down a down vote with no context is a difficult thing well, to get a sense of. And, and it's of. tricky, isn't it? Because you know, I mean, um, the three of us have talked about this a lot in, in previous shows about you know the 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 flaws in things such as five star rating systems, right? Everyone's definition of three stars is different, yes. and some people will never ever give five stars because they believe that imperfection has not been uh, perfection has not been found yet. I think we sometimes it's easy for those of us who take an interest in technology to kind of expect too much from these ways of providing simple feedback without writing but all of the flaws that you're highlighting jeremy i think are completely evident there the the tricky thing here in my mind with the whole social media topic when the most contentious ill if you will is the perspectives on censorship Mm. right so um uh, joe rogan who i'm an enormous fan of he's got his podcast and one of the things i like about joe rogan is he has really quite radically different people who go on there. He has some people who are, you know, business people, but he'll also have some controversial figures on there. And he, and he, he engages with them in a very conversational way. He had Jack Dorsey from Twitter on there recently, and Joe Rogan got an enormous amount of heat about that interview. I actually haven't watched the interview, so there's the caveat. But um, Joe Rogan constantly complains about, the, um, about people who are being, like, why are some people banned on Twitter and why are some other people not banned on Twitter? And he was he was he was um, absolutely like burnt alive on Twitter and elsewhere because people felt like he softballed the topic with Jack Dorsey and apparently he's going to kind of come back on and they're going to they're going to address it. But I think that's a really interesting question. Why is it that some people um, like I'll give you an example? The um, you know there was that whole thing in the news about those kids um, who uh, who were wearing the Make America Great Again caps and they were and they were. There was the kid who was like staring at the Native American guy. Yes, I, I think, you know the they, they were from a Catholic school. These kids, that thing basically set on fire, right? And I'm, I don't want to get into the politics of of what happened there, but there were some people on Twitter who were uh, like, there was one I forget the person's name who basically said like, you know, this kid should be punched in the face, right? And that is a that goes against. <clears throat> Twitter's terms and conditions around inciting violence or whatever it might be. And it seems like what you get these certain people will, will, will make those kinds of statements and they won't get banned and certain other people will get banned. And I don't really understand. And this is the problem with social in my mind is 
it, it is a private company who's running this. It really is at their discretion, to be fair. But people are treating social media networks like they're a utility, like they're, that it's part of their right to free speech. So consequently, this issue around censorship is an ill because some people do get banned who probably shouldn't. But a lot of people get banned who absolutely should. But we've all got different definitions of what that looks like. And I don't think there's an answer to that, right? I mean, you okay. know, like, I think Alex Jones, I don't know, for example, like, I think what he said about the the the, the kid massacre, the, you know, the school massacre is absolutely heinous. But, you know, I, I understand why Twitter would ban him. But other people are of the view you should be able to say whatever the hell you want because of free speech. What do we think? The thing that I don't like about the whole free speech argument, and I, I say this as being a huge proponent of free speech, is that right. free speech applies from a constitutional perspective from the government silencing you, not private for-profit companies banning you from their platform. So exactly. as soon as someone says something about First Amendment rights and they're talking about Twitter or Facebook, you immediately know they don't know what they're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's where I think the... And, and Joe Rogan talks about this a little bit in another show that he did, where he talks about, you know, this perception of social media networks being a utility, which is where I think that lies, is that the three of us, we can quite easily say it's at their discretion. It's at the it's Twitter's discretion. I think we all pretty much agree on that. But I don't think the general public understands that and necessarily knows that and or sees it that way. So I think that's a big ill with social media is who has the right to speak? Right. And then, of course, there's a question around how it gets amplified. Well, and then consistency um, around that parameter is also really, really difficult because I think right. what a lot of people don't that. want is the other side to have a voice, and they're fine with them being censored as long as their side isn't censored, and that's really not how things should work. No, no. Uh, I think people's complaints... Um, I think uh, the complaint I hear a lot about Twitter and silencing people and what have you is not even that it's one-sided or the other. You will always get people on side A saying, it's not fair, our side's being silenced and the other side's being let roam. And that will happen on both sides. It's how arbitrary it is. It's it's very, very easy to find examples of some people who were banned and other people who did the same thing and were not banned. And, I mean, to some extent, this was a bit of what was behind... You know, my rather ridiculous prediction last year that Trump would get banned from Twitter, right? Because I, I bet you you could find... I haven't gone out and done this, but I bet you you could find people who would say things the same as the president of the US has and who've been banned from Twitter for violating their terms of service. And both of you, honestly, quite rightly, mocked the idea that it would happen. But if you examine that thought process, like, of course they're not going to ban him. He's the president. But that's right. al that's almost implicitly admitting the fact that some people are above banning because they're famous. Uh, I I too too big to ban. Well, too big yeah, to ban. I mean, I, I mean, maybe maybe I'm unfairly characterising you here, but that's slightly kind of how I feel about it. I've, I've read a re there's actually a really interesting article I read only today uh, on a site called Unheard, which I'd never heard of, ironically enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's called The Truth About the Tech Lash. And remind me, and I'll link to it in the show notes. But they make exactly the same point, uh, Jonathan, that you made there, that... Uh, Quoting from it, whether it's Google, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon, we know they are private spaces, but we feel like they're public commons. The way we right. act, campaign, raise money, argue, unite on these platforms screams a public space. And public spaces, we feel, are subject to rules that are publicly made. And this yeah. article is making the point about how the decision-making process behind all of these social networks, because they're not actually public utilities, they act like they're public utilities, <clears throat> and they Do certainly... They? They, yeah, I mean, they certainly seem to present themselves as, hey, we're here to defend free speech and let people... But it's like, you're talking in the manner of someone doing a service to humanity. I, you're not I don't think they are talking like that. I mean, they've been... Reddit... Facebook have been pretty equivocal that they're not going to allow any free speech and that they have a certain level that they do want to ban. Where that level is, that, some people would say is capricious, but uh, they're not I, saying... That's, that's not quite what I mean. Um, um, when you see them, they're private companies, right? 
So right. what they should be saying, their argument ought to be, we're going to do this thing because it makes us more money and that's all we're here to do. We're a, we're a publicly held company. Our job is to deliver value to stockholders. They shouldn't be talking about things like the wider good of humanity and so on. But they do because that's the sort of thing that makes people feel like these are slightly in the public ownership because they've got, at least they profess to have, more noble goals about society. Rather, If they went, we're going to ban this thing or we're not going to ban this thing because it makes us more money, then you might go, well, that's sad and I wish you didn't feel like that, but you can't realistically argue with it. If you talk, I, I, if you talk yeah. about... I've um, part of our goal is to bring the world's knowledge to everyone in the world. Then, if you're talking about society level goals, there's sort of a pervasive feeling that you ought to be acting in a society way rather than saying, "Oh, but the decisions will get made by the nine guys on the board." I, I don't. Th I think. I think you're reading too much into the way they present themselves. Like I just went in an incognito window so i'm not logged in <clears throat> to look at the front page of twitter facebook instagram and linkedin and none of them say anything about defending free speech or even anything to do with free speech or it's just like twitter follow your interests hear what people are talking about join the conversation facebook connect with your friends and uh, around the world share what's new find more about what you're looking for with facebook search uh, ready uh, re re um, before you go on twitter's faq their mission statement is to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. That's their right. mission statement. But that, that, that's yeah. very different to defending free speech. I never mentioned, so, well, to the extent that I mentioned free speech, I was wrong, right? I, my point was I was talking about them talking about society level goals. It's not about the free speech argument. It's about well, them I talking mean, in the way that makes them seem like more than a for-profit corporation doing things for monetary stuff, I, but, 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 look, making this... but reserving the right to make decisions and decide on how they do things secretively without public oversight, without societal goals, and say, no, we don't have to listen to what people want to do because we're a company. It's like but, wanting, uh, the, good, wanting I, the good parts no, from both on. sides. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, 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 look, every company has got marketing puffery around what they're there to do, right? Like you, the way in which you're going to get people, some people joining your platform is to have a big vision, a big, a big goal. Um, just because someone has a, a big vision around something that has a broader societal, um, you know, impact doesn't mean that they, they need to be completely open and collaborative in the way that they operate their business. That's just not the way it works. Right. I, I don't think that there's been, in my mind, an overt level of marketing on any of the social networks around being the bastions of open sharing and free speech. What I think they've said is, we provide a platform to help you get your ideas, information out as easily as possible and to connect to people who you have an interest in, <coughs> which frankly, that, that, that's what they're there to do. The one exception I would have here is Reddit. Now, Reddit, I don't really think of as a social network so much. Um, but... They used to, years ago, very much have a um, a, a view of, uh, you know, we're here to support free speech. And they came under fire, particularly when the Donald subreddit sprung into action in 2015 or 2016, because um, they went around banning, uh, like there was, I forget some of the subreddits that they banned, but there was a bunch of like racist, like white supremacy subreddits that they went around banning. And... They came under fire deeply because of their, their, they were talking about their attitudes towards free speech. I remember they would have, I forget what it was, they had like a thing on a page which was, if this thing disappears, then the FBI's qu qu queried them for information on their users, like it's, a canary it, it, kind of thing. Called, it's called a warrant canary. That's right. So Reddit, I think, has definitely, they've reined it in a little bit. Um, the tricky thing in my mind with the censorship thing is, to your point earlier on, <laughs> There isn't a clear dotted line between this account has been banned and these are the reasons why. Some people might read about that in the press, right? So blah, blah, blah. Like Milo Yiannopoulos, right? Everyone calls him a provocateur. I just think the guy's a dick. Um, uh, he got banned. And I believe the reason why he got banned was because of incitement of violence, I think was what it was. And then there was that whole thing around the... He made some comment about pedophilia or something like that in an interview. I forget what it was. Uh, but he was banned. 
And the, the, the rationale and justification for the banning was really, you'd read about that in the news. There's no way to look at that in the platform, right? Like if you go to that person's account, um, it just says this account is no longer available. It doesn't explain why. And I, that could be one of the solutions to this is there should be a there should be a clear way where y- yes you can disagree with a ban if you believe if, if that's what you if that's what you think but you should be able to see why the person was banned um, that to me is one element but the other element here as well there should be a path to redemption this is something that Joe Rogan talks about imagine you get banned for something right particularly young people right we've all done stupid shit as as when we were younger <clears throat> imagine you did something when you were younger uh, like the the the, the, there's an example of this guy. I forget his name. He used to be like a hardcore white supremacist, right? And uh, now he's well, he saw the error of his ways a number of years ago, and now he's like a very active proponent around the risks of white supremacy and racism. And he goes out and he speaks to universities, and he's basically, basically, you know, redeemed himself. The thing that worries me a little bit is that if you get banned in a social media network, and then you find you you, you express a level of redemption and and you change, there should be a way back. And there isn't currently a way for that. And what this is generating is a bit of a banning culture in some ways, where some people are banned, but how do they, how do they kind of come back? And, and yes, they could set up another account or whatever else, but to me, there should be a way of, a clear way in which we can understand why people are banned, but then also you can understand clearly how you can kind of get back on the platform presuming you make some suitable changes. And that doesn't really exist today, well, from what I can tell. Well, I think... I think there's another angle that's worthwhile looking at this from. We we talked about mm. how there were sort of two levels. You've got the 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 freedom of speech, do we ban people um part of it, censorship and so on. But then you've also got our social media networks accentuating the bad stuff, deliberately or otherwise. Yes. And what I don't want this to do is to just get derailed into the same conversation about should people have the right to write wherever they want on the internet and so on, because that conversation's been had a hundred million times before. Yeah, right? I agree. It's not what, interesting anymore. What, no. what, I, what I, th- I mean, <clears throat> um, it's an interesting conversation, but I'm not sure we're going to bring much to it that hasn't already been well, there's said. There's nothing new, is there? P- people have yeah. been arguing about this since the ancient Greeks, right? right. <laughs> yes, if, if not earlier. Um, but what <laughs> yeah. what is kind of new-ish, I think, here, is the power that, a social, that social networks have to to accentuate or to downplay this type of thing. So the ban hammer is obviously the, you have firmly overstepped the rules, bang, and now you're out entirely, and then there's a whole question of a path to redemption and so on. But what I think is more interesting is, with, in a way that we haven't seen before, it is now possible for someone to be harassed off a platform or to, um, or, or to find themselves dragged into a, 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 a rabbit hole of content they wouldn't otherwise watch and get radicalised or whatever. And that's... That, I think, is the more interesting thing, because that, to me, is something that social networks have done that didn't exist before. Like, it was much... I don't quite understand what you mean. Yeah, are you talking I, about from the perspective of the people who are consuming the content? Yeah. It's, or are you talking about the people who are um, producing it? Um, <coughs> leave, leaving the banning stuff aside... Yeah. yeah. If people are saying things that you... Uh, that, that are bad in some way, but you don't see that... And the people who it's deliberately written to offend don't see it either. Then that to me seems like a lesser problem than if they do see it. But it doesn't re- it involve having to ban us. I mean, if people were going, oh, if people are going on about something you've done, Jono, on what's that Reddit replacement called? The terrible Voted. one, vote. That's the name of it, right? So people are going on um, about something you've done on vote. You don't actually care that much right you're not yeah. there to be, to be very you're... clear everyone people aren't going on about something that I've done I, I, vote. I, I have, I have... at least I, at least i don't think so i've never been a vote no i've, N- I've... neither has anyone else from America. Well, no, <laughs> to it... your point exactly. <laughs> but, but, but that's exactly my point and then there's a the whole thing about you know instead of saying well we need to, um instead of saying well those people who had their right to speech suppressed um say well go ahead and talk but not in a way that hits the person they're trying to get at and mm. and social networks make it very easy. There, there is a there is a big benefit in me being able to directly talk to 
a celebrity person, right? In a way that makes them do- makes them seem normal. Um, yeah. But that also brings with it the possibility that it's very easy to harass someone. And it's very yeah. easy for you and 5,000 of your mates to harass someone. And that, I think, is something which social networking has made much more possible. The, the, the idea of dogpiling and brigading and the idea of being able to yeah. anonymously say things which then get seen. And then the social networks essentially seeing that stuff as something which drives engagement and therefore drives money and playing it up rather than playing it down. And that, I think, is the more interesting side of the conversation. Yeah, it, to your point, the, there's a question here around... You know, it's like on Facebook, right? If you if you go beyond a a relatively small threshold of people you're connected to, or people who you're who you're following on Twitter, it applies to all the networks. You know, if you follow two thousand people on Twitter, you can't possibly see all of their posts. So Twitter and these social networks, they by definition have to do a certain amount of, um, you know to use a, a poor choice of terms, QoS, the content. So well, well they, 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 don't have, they, more... don't, they don't have to do the algorithmic timeline. They have elected to in order to present you with things which they think you will be more interested in. That you'll be more interested right. in. Right. I Otherwise, think most people would a... prefer a chronological timeline. That's exactly right. the point. Nobody likes the algorithmic timeline. No. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I, don't think, I, I, I didn't say everyone dislikes it. Nobody likes it. I, th- I think I don't. I, well, I don't think anyone knows that it's. I think most people just don't know that it's the thing. I mean, it's just how social media works, <laughs> and and all these marketing people like tr- think they understand how they can game it, so they can kind of. They think they understand how the mar- the algorithm works, so they can get their content to the top. No one knows. It's, right. it's a complete mystery. I would agree with that. But so what that does is it puts those social media networks in a in a position where they they're editorializing, right? Yeah. So it's not like you just see what's what's coming out. And I suspect that historically the reason why certain content bubbles up to the surface is because it becomes interesting, gets a lot of views and clicks and responses and whatever else, which the tricky thing here in my mind is, 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 is when you're, if you're wanting to influence and influence a narrative is that something that's incredibly abusive could be, could get all activity for all, either for the wrong reasons or because people keep pushing back against it, um, or something that is a really interesting, valuable piece of content that's enriching people can get that because people are interacting with it. And I think that the social media networks are in an awkward position. They're trying to figure out how, to, how, how that works. The real question in my mind that underpins all of this is, do we think it's okay for a user on a social media network to have a constructive conversation about anything um, and there be visibility on that, even potentially heinous things, right? Like, is it okay? Here's a classic example. Is it okay for someone to provide a supporting view as it relates to, let's say, abortion, right? On social media, if somebody basically says, um, I don't believe abortion should be legal, as an example. Is it okay to have that conversation and as long as it's non-threatening, as long as it's not abusive, um, and for that to bubble up to the surface? It doesn't matter what the topic is. It bubbles up to the surface because people are having a constructive discussion. I don't believe that's the case in a lot of social media networks today. I don't, I don't know why social media would even come into play in, as part of the question, I guess. It's, if, it's... if that's the home of the, if that's where the content's hosted, right? So... Like abortion is an is a is a topic as an example that divides a lot of people, right? Yes. So, if if the network is being run by people who are more pro life, as an example, the people who are going to be pro choice going to be pushed down because the algorithm has been being edit like is editing them down. Now, the cynics of the world think that that's the case, right? The cynics of the world believe that so particularly people on the right are, are believe that the, all these networks are run by left wingers who are pushing all the right wing content out of the way. But I, I do you think that's happening? Do you guys think? I, there is that narrative that's determining this stuff. I'm not entirely sure there is. To be honest with you, I think, unfortunately, what they're doing is they're optimizing for the wrong thing. 
they think it's the right thing, but it's the wrong one, right? Uh, if if someone's having a conversation about abortion and your goal as the people who run that network is to drive engagement, to drive more people to tweet more things about it, right. then the people you are best showing that to are people who don't like abortion. You deliberately want to whip people up because that's engagement. I, right. I, I mean, I, I'm... I, I appreciate that I'm stating. You're, you're right. I, I'm stating this as a fact that I haven't proved it, but I think we would probably all agree that <laughs> yeah. you are you are more likely to respond to something you disagree with than something you agree with, and you're more likely to respond to something you agree with than something you don't care about. Yeah. So you've got sure, don't right. care, <clears throat> agree with, disagree with as ascending in uh, how much you're prepared to engage with a thing. So if you want people to be engaged, then the thing to do is essentially start fights, right? And if you look at, um, did you see the YouTube thing this weekend, uh, just this past weekend, a, an, ex no. an ex-YouTube engineer wrote up a big list of things about how he was involved in building the AI um, for choosing recommended videos or the next videos and so on. And that was very much driven around showing people things which would either pull them into conspiracy rabbit holes where they continue to watch videos over and over and over, or would show them things they don't like so they respond to it. So it's designed deliberately to foster discontent because that's what makes people click on things. Right. It, it, yeah. a, a thought experiment for you, right? Imagine that... Twitter, Facebook, whatever, um, YouTube, um, these social networks. Imagine that their overriding thing, the thing they wanted to maximise, was not engagement, but happiness. That's what they sat down and made the AIs do. We want people to come away from our service feeling better than they did when they started. Not It would turn into a massive echo chamber because people want to be, people want their biases confirmed and their opinions confirmed. Okay. So that so, wouldn't be better, it would be bad in a different way. So next question then. Imagine that happened. That that to me seems slightly worst case scenario, but I'll spot you that for the sake of argument. So people get their biases confirmed. Would that be would a bunch of echo chambers, which is what we had ten years ago, would that be worse than what we've got today? I mean, it's not Twitter's job to... This is what I'm talking about, the society thing, right? You're saying um, then people get their biases confirmed and what Twitter should be doing is fostering conversation across things. Why? That's not their job. That's the Oh, I didn't say that's job. what they should be doing. I just, yeah. you asked a question and I gave you an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that's the thing. If you think it's Twitter's job to help people mingle across the divides, then that's, taking, that's them taking a societal role, which is what I was talking about earlier. And that's not their job. I also yeah. don't think humanity dictates that's possible. You are not going to, on, on an issue that is so fundamental to who a lot of people are that, as the issues we're talking here, a stranger on the internet is not going to convince you to change your mind. It's just not, humanity dictates that's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how the social dynamics of how we engage with each other um, very enormously depending on the, the 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 context and the topic so for example if you go online we see this in the open source community all the time right i know thousands of people myself included who have joined the open source community um, around working on a project or joining a community and they're all like really eager to learn from other people and to develop their skills because the engagement between those people is about um it's it's in it's it, it's enriching their their, their skill set, right? Their, you become a better developer, you become a better community manager or documentation writer or whatever else, whatever else. But when someone posts something on Facebook that's political um, or even something about a movie and you disagree with it, there's no enrichment happening. It's just people throwing buns at each other and trying to get one up on the other. It's winning internet points and it's fucking stupid. And uh, I, I agree with, 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 with your point, Ak, about like these... By definition, engagement has a, a direct correlation to outrage yeah. um, and fighting. And the, the networks are going to have to... It, I think if they don't try and solve this problem in some way, um, we're start, already starting to see more and more of a trend of people saying, I didn't look at Facebook for a week and I felt better. The yes. tech clash. Yes, absolutely. Right. 
There, so. there is a huge externality here, which is that, yes, um, uh, pivoting to let's make people happier <laughs> or whatever, as opposed to let's drive engagement, means that your competitors who are still driving engagement will see more clicks, get more people involved, get more advertiser money, get more money generally, and then they get to win and you lose. But the risk is, the externality is, the whole concept of social media gets discredited. And then it becomes a late 2000s, early 2010s flash in the pan. And 20 years now, people will be like, oh, do you remember that thing like when we were kids and you used to post everything you were doing all the time and have conversations. People go, oh, yeah, the social media thing. I'd forgotten all about that. <laughs> and it'll be like, you know, um, leatherette ties in the 80s. It'll be uh, <laughs> rather than a thing which which continues to define how we do social intercourse from now on. It becomes a thing of its yeah. own because it discredits the whole concept. Yeah. Well, and 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 particularly, I think the as the internet is connecting more and more of us together, one of the things I've I've noticed as well is it's easier than ever to create societal trends and for them to spread over a, over a broad a broad distance, right? So, for example, I'll give you I'll give you a small example. Before the internet, we'd see regional trends forming. I've just read this book about about black metal in the early '90s and all these church burnings and all this violence and murder that happened around around that movement in Norway, but it was relatively constrained to that region in 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 uh, in Europe. It didn't really spread much beyond that. But with the internet, a trend can form, and it can be something as simple as, um, you know, I don't know, um, organic coffee, and it can spread all over the world. And people like being part of that trend. And I think what's going to start happening here is in the same way that we've had out. Well, I've had out my theory about screen time is going to become a responsible life thing in the same way that people try to eat organic and the same that people try to recycle. I think people are going to be more conservative with screen time. And I think there's going to be a similar thing going to happen with social media. Um, young kids, I think are going to, grow, going to grow up and they're going to, they're going to know from their parents the, the ills of social media a little bit more. And it wouldn't surprise me if there'll be a bit of a blowback against it. I, yeah, I, I, that, that's the thing which, would worry me if I were running one of these companies that um, I've got these 10 years and then the whole concept goes away. Uh, so yeah. so a question then, uh, the, the question we originally posed is how do we stop it? I mean, I can identify a few things that I think drive the problem. The fact that people push for engagement above happiness and uh, 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 and virality is seen as a good thing. But what I don't know is, even if e even if you spot me for the sake of argument that those two things are the problem and we want to stop them, I don't get how you motivate companies to want to stop them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... That's the tricky one. Yeah. yeah. The, the, this I, is, I, I've, I've said before, I, I've certainly said before to you, John, and I think I've said before on the show that every time I get into a discussion with any kind of serious how do we do this question, I end up going, you know the five whys thing? where you ask why no. uh, repeatedly until you get back to the root cause. The root cause of all of them is always destroy capitalism, right? <laughs> Which I hate. Because <laughs> I end up you know, getting into these discussions and then the way you fix this is destroying capitalism. And this is... Which is bloody ridiculous, right? But well, and that, also we probably wouldn't have this problem if we didn't have capitalism. Well, so, yeah, but, uh, but this is exactly my so point. We, don't, we wouldn't have a lot of nice things. Yeah. So, so you say, so. okay, the issue is that social media companies prioritise engagement over happiness. Um, why do they do that? Because then they get more people using it and they're more motivated. Why do they do that? Because they get more ad money. Why do they do that? Because they want more money. Why do they do that? Because the shareholders need more money. How do we fix it? You can't fix that. Other than going, well, let's just destroy capitalism and make it so money isn't what motivates people, which is not going to work. No. I think there's one simple fix that they could do, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. But if you look at YouTube... I'm waiting with bated breath here. You, when, when you think of YouTube, like YouTube is a pretty divisive network for a lot of people for, for various reasons. But where is it that everybody agrees the garbage is in YouTube? It's in the comment box. 
You can watch a YouTube None. video. You can watch a YouTube video with kittens cuddling each other in a cuddle puddle. And there'll be there'll be an argument about, you know, Hitler in the comment box, right? I think switch off the comments and social media networks. What's Twitter Allow without comments? To- Allow people so to Twitter share stuff. Twitter is a comment stream. That's it, right? No, you can you can you can have people post comments, but you don't allow replies. It's an extreme view. I'm not going to deny, but you allow people to share material. I still think they can, going to they some of like the things X said earlier about how the algorithm will give you will almost force you down a rabbit hole, especially if you're of a certain personality type. I, yeah. That's not going to fix that problem. So I think part of the interesting thing here is the way social networks online shape your thinking in real life in a, in a dangerous way. So I don't think it would fix that aspect of it. It would make them seem less toxic on the surface because the comments wouldn't be there to look toxic. But I think the underlying damage that it's had on kind of uh, the, I don't even know how to word it, societal happiness or whatever, uh, or systemic healthiness of the people participating in it. I don't think it would help that aspect. I just think if you look at if you look at if you look at YouTube videos that uh, YouTube videos that have comments disabled, um, yes, there might be a bunch of down votes, and that's fine, um, and there'll be some up votes. But if you look at the where the toxicity is in these social media networks, it's in the resulting discussion after someone posts something. Like if we break it into the material that people post is one question, and then the response from the audience who posted. Yes, some people will post some toxic com- content to to various social media networks. But to me, the real issue here is the toxicity of the response. That's where the brigading happens. That's where, that's where it gets really ugly. I, and I, again, I don't think they're going to do this. I'd still view them as two separate, that. and I don't want to say unrelated, but nearly unrelated problems. And that the, the thing that I've seen, especially recently, let's say in the last three, four years with social networks, is that it's impacting people's viewpoints in a way that, I knew this person for a long time and they would have never held some of these viewpoints and now they hold this viewpoint. And I very, very, very much think that the algorithms and the way social media is currently um, incentivized has created that viewpoint. Yeah. So I think it would, it would make the place, like I said, appear less toxic and there'd be less actual fights there. But the shifting of how people view certain things and the polarization that's currently happening really across Earth... It, it, I don't think it would fix that aspect of it, and I think you really right. need to address both aspects of it. Question on that yeah. front, Jeremy. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're saying that social media has taken the impact that it's had has made people who have historically been quite left wing or right wing even more left wing and even more right wing because what they're seeing it, because there's an element of demonizing the other side that so they're kind of they're forming their own culture it's, it's around that so it's it's not even left versus right it, it, from some of the things that I'm talking about and some of it is right there's definitely that illusory truth effect where if if you hear something repeated over and over again eventually regardless of what it is you think it's true and correct and, uh, and almost right. absolute that's true yeah. so that that's causing people to go further to the left and further to the right or further that's a political example but take any example and, and further to one end and, and to the other end they, but they, I think aside Aside from that polarization, it, whatever, right? It's yeah. things like that that aren't really right or left. It's just those yeah. kinds of things are being perpetuated in a way that is almost unprecedented. You mean like the fringe, the, the like the fringe elements of society? Yes, is that kind of what you mean. Yeah, right. I agree with you. But but do you think do you think that if we were to? I know this is a ludicrous suggestion, and they're never going to stop taking comments on these social media networks. But if if social media networks primarily became a a, a mechanism in which people share articles, information, ideas, things like that. Um, Cause like, if you look at Pinterest, for example, I mean, I, I don't use Pinterest, uh, yeah, I but do. I know people who love it. It seems like a generally pretty happy, healthy place. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that is cause it's basically, it's essentially from what I can tell, it's basically Instagram for sharing pictures of expensive tables. <laughs> and uh, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, it My wife me. is going to kill me when she hears that comment. <laughs> uh, so your um, couch is like the most viewed thing on Pinterest, I take it? <laughs> uh, maybe. But, you know, um, the, the focus is on the content. It's not so much on the, the conversation. And I, that's kind of what's driving this. Is I, I, I suspect 
Yeah, I, don't I, know. I understand what you're saying. Um, I, 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 Jeremy's point is exactly right. I think, um, yes, toxicity in the comments and toxicity of the algorithm driving you to other content is a separate of separate things, and they are separate problems. And yes. cutting off cu- cutting off comments only fixes one of those. But it does. Yeah. In my mind, it's hard to see how you can have a social network without some method of commenting on what other people have done. Then it's just a bunch of separate silos, right? No, 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 which, no, no. no. Which, I'm, which, I'm not which suggesting means, that. Which means that because people want to comment on what other people have done, essentially newly created content will just be responses. So if I'm not allowed to comment on the thing that you've done, I will just do a new thing myself where I say, Jono said this and... <laughs> Right. Right. No, I, what I'm what, what what I'm suggesting All here is all of YouTube is... becomes response videos instead of comments, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, no, what I what I'm suggesting here is um if you look at Reddit as as one example of a um of a of a, you know, a pretty popular social media network, yeah. although we don't necessarily think that it's a social media network. They have 234 million unique users. Yeah. Uh, and 542 million monthly users. Yeah. Um, a fraction of those users will actually post any comment. They'll be primarily going there. They may upvote, they may downvote, but they'll be primarily consuming the material, right? Like I've shared on the show and elsewhere, my theory of for every 100 people, 10 of those people will drive most, will generate most of the content for the other 90, right? Um, And if you go to Reddit as a user and you don't get into the comment box, it's actually a pretty efficient way of seeing really interesting content. Um, so I think what you do is you give the control of the to the audience in a way that basically tries to avoid them typing stuff in. It could be upvoting, it could be downvoting, it could be emojis like we have in um, uh, in in Facebook. People can interact with the content, and they can generate their they, they can they can rate it, but what it avoids is a bunch of uninformed people arguing with other uninformed people, which is the problem with social media network uh, um, with social media. I. I I can see that for Reddit. I think there's less of a motive for people to actually post stuff because they're not going to get the feedback and therefore the gratification. But well, they don't get the dopamine hit, right? And that's right, the problem, exactly. Right, but with my but approach, honestly, yeah. I wasn't kidding about Twitter. Twitter is all comments. People are not posting content on Twitter and then getting responses, right? It's not like Reddit where there's a top line thing and then underneath it there's a bunch of comments. Or like YouTube where there's a video and underneath there's a bunch of comments. If you say, well, you can't comment on other stuff, Twitter isn't anything. That's all it is. No, it's no. the comment box without the bit of content at the top. So I, I actually use Twitter in the exact opposite way in that I don't ever really comment on... So I have two accounts with Twitter, a personal account and then the Linux Questions account. So Linux Question is really just disseminating information about Linux and open source and, and ingesting right. that. But my personal account, I don't think I've actually even ever posted, but I really like sports. I really like football. The Some of the best news outlets and especially some of the most timely news Really, realistically, does happen on Twitter, and I want to ingest that news, so I just yeah. use it as a read-only news stream segmented exactly. in tweet deck by topic. So I have a football list, and I have an open source list, and a bunch of different lists across one screen, and it really is timely quality. Yeah, you have to certainly curate that. who you follow, and and that, that takes time up front. But once you have that list well curated, the, the news is great. I think most people, I think, well, not most people, I think a lot of Twitter users get their information from Twitter. I think, again, I bet you anything, a a higher proportion of Twitter users will respond because I think that's the way that the the network has been primarily designed. But a big chunk of it is for disseminating information these days. And it would require rewiring it in a way. Yes, you could respond to somebody by posting a new topic, a, a, a a new tweet, but... That to me is the issue. It's the re- it's replies. Let, let people become content producers. That's why blogging became so popular because people could become content producers. Well, Social media gave the power thinking, to them. You're describing the world in which people write things, and I subscribe to all their RSS feeds, and I like that world. I'd like that. Back, I miss. I from, miss that world. I'll be yeah, honest. And why, why was that world? <laughs> why was that world so great? It was. It was great because it was. It was focused on the content, not focused on the comment. And at that point, uh, I think there's more to it, though. When, because it yes. was early adopters, it was passionate yeah. people who were posting about oh, a thing yeah. they really yeah. cared about in a way that, of course, once there's a billion users, that just it, the dynamics are different. 
But yeah. I, I'm still convinced, and I think if you look at it, no, I think that the content I, is the key. I think, um, honestly, I what you're describing, I think is actually a reasonable thing. I just think, you said there's 235 million people on Reddit, right? And there's, what is it, 2 billion on Facebook? And... Um, Twitter's, right. Twitter's got a billion or whatever. I think what you're describing would be a world which is uh, rather nicer to participate in um, and is much more informative and much more informed and much better and would have a tenth the number of users. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you're right. At which point you go back to the VCs who are funding these companies and say, we want a better world with a tenth as many users. And they go, no. We're not interested. Actually, in that. you know what? I don't know if there be. Uh, I actually don't know. Imagine you take. Oh, we're gonna have to wrap it up in a second. But imagine you take Facebook. Yeah. Just and say, and, it become, say it's imagine, gonna, and say okay, people are funding it. It's gonna make a tenth as much money, but it will be better for the world. Hang on, hang on, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Imagine, imagine you, imagine you. Were to, we're gonna re rewire history. We're gonna be revisionist there. Okay. Imagine Facebook. It kicked off, and instead of it being Imagine it's everything that you got today, right? So you've got people can post their pictures, they can post, you know, their opinions about stuff. There's no reply box, okay? All the same functionality. So you can still keep in touch where you can still see your baby pictures and people people's lunches and whatever else you want to look at. But there's no reply box. I am pretty certain that um it would still be popular. It would it might be it might knock off some people. But it would still be popular, and it would be way healthier. I don't think it would be nearly that, as popular because they would have never gotten the views to get the advertising revenue that created the dollars that got them where they are today. That's exactly what um, I think. Maybe. That, yeah. That's exactly what I think. Well, but if we're going to try, if, if, if there's going to be a solution to this problem, there's got to be there's got to be a sacrifice, right? So, right, but yeah, you but, know. What, but what you're talking about the sacrifice. What, the question is, that, what's the right sacrifice? What you're talking about the the sacrifice is that people have to voluntarily make less money to make the world a better place. And the you way, wanted to kill capitalism, and the way you do that, honestly, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Is that's your answer? Destroy capitalism. That's the only thing. I mean, we talked about what did you call them? B corporations. Where they um, right. where they write into their um, uh, you know their company description document that part of their responsibility is to make the world better and not just to make money. And I said yeah. all companies should be that. Yes, all companies should be that. <laughs> but at the moment, people are motivated by money, and even if they're not motivated by money, the people who are funding them are motivated by money. Well, you know what? It's that time, bad voltage listeners. It's time for you to come and share on community.badvoltage.org what you think how, are we right are we wrong how i'm sure we glad we've that? solved this problem yeah <laughs> i mean we've, we've we've nearly fixed it um but you know go and finish the job for us we we've loosened the cap now go and take it <laughs> up okay um yeah fascinating discussion i think this is something we might talk about again in the future um so go and let us know uh and yeah we'd love to see what you think yeah. what and not only what you think the problems are but what do you think is the solution i mean it's probably not switching off replies but what else do you think could happen without necessarily destroying capitalism yeah um, or destroying capitalism uh, how, do we, how do we do it? how do we optimize for happiness Okay, that was all cool. Um, I've got this brilliant. It. I've come up with this brilliant new scheme, by the way, that I have to tell you about. Um, I've, des- I've decided that I would like to own a bag of gold from every country on Earth. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, come on. <laughs> well, as you mention it. <laughs> He's taking the mick out of me because I set a, a goal, particularly for this year, to taste the gin from every. Uh, from every country on the planet. And I appreciate that not all countries necessarily make gin. And uh, it, in some... I'm, I'm not taking the big out of your goal. That is, I think, a very noble and very interesting little project you've taken on. What I'm taking the mick out of is, I bet you don't plan on buying all of this gin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I'm, I'm not going to deny that uh, uh, there may be the possibility of some free gin in this whole uh, situation. And already a few people have said, hey, I have, you know, I'll, bring you, I'll bring you a bottle. Which is good. Like, I've actually managed to condition my friends. When everyone visits my uh, our house, they usually bring a bottle of gin now, which is great. 
Oh, this is like the so, Pavlov uh, thing where you ring a bell and they salivate. They just bring gin. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, so they bring to, gin and I salivate. <laughs> so, so, so I'll have to find a bottle of Liberian gin or something. Which, which exactly. I'm sure Michael Jackson did a song about. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you want to track the progress, johnabacon.com slash gin is where the map is. I'm, I'm putting them on the map. So, And if you bring me a bottle of gin, uh, we'll take a picture of it uh, and I'll put you as the contributor on it as well. So... You know, that's worth it, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. Uh, how, very, how very community focused. I'd like to build a community where people buy me drinks and I drink the drinks. <laughs> you know what? The bacon um, gin map. I'm a, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. That's, uh, people say this all the time. It's, it's what they love about me the most, Stuart Langridge. <laughs> uh, it's, I, can anyway. t- I can tell you it's not what I love about you the most. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's not get into that. Um, so anyway, so on that bombshell, <laughs> I think we should wrap it up um, again. Go and check out uh, badvoltage.org slash live. We've got our live show coming up in Pasadena at scale. Yes. Um, System 76 getting us out there. Um, you, you can use B Vault to buy a ticket, uh, to get a yes. ticket discount for scale. Yeah, it's it's we, we've already we're in, in the in in the process of developing the show and it's shaping up to be a, a good one. So it is. be sure to join us there. It's going to be a blast. We always have such a good time. So uh, check it out. And again, go and let us know your thoughts on social media on the forum. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>